I'm going to look at three areas in this debate. First, how Team Ireland's criteria directly contradicts the principle. Second, why conflict between nations will be worsened by unilateral secession. And finally, why conflicts within the region will be worsened by unilateral secession. And on all these three points, I'm going to show you why Team Singapore had the superior side in this debate. So let's go on to my first point. Why Team Ireland's criteria contradicts their own principles? Now, Team Ireland's third speaker came to us and said that yes, rights exist, but there must be prerequisites for these rights. And the prerequisites were Team Ireland's criteria. But if Team Ireland had been listening to my side's case, our side's case was directly aimed at proving that none of these criteria systemically will ever be met when a nation unilaterally secedes from its host country. So because a right that is never able to be exercised is not a right, we say that Team Singapore have taken this debate. I'll be talking more about this later than my other two points of contention. That's what my second speaker was telling you about when he came up and accused Team Ireland of a massive shrinking policy. And you know what? By their third speaker, it became evident they're only really talking about one country, and that is Scotland. So let's take on Scotland right here and right now. We think, yes, okay, England probably is not going to attack Scotland as Scotland unilaterally breaks away from England. But what is England going to do? England's going to cut off all trade ties with Scotland. It's going to stop backing the Scottish currency. It's going to deny Scotland recognition on the international stage, which it can do because those evil, diabolical Englishmen that will colonize all of us have a the United Nations. That's what England's going to do. Guys, they were even willing to rig the entire Scottish election system so the Scottish Nationalistic Party would find it incredibly difficult to come into power. And if you think about Scotland's history, why did Scotland join the UK? Because of a banking crisis. Guys, Scotland isn't an economically viable nation by itself. I'm sorry if there are any Scots in the audience. No, thank you. We think they fill your criteria too. So the only nation you're willing to talk about doesn't even fulfill your own criteria. But let's just assume for a moment that we accepted everything they said. I'm still going to prove to you why the existence of this fundamental right doesn't allow you to succeed unilaterally. First of all, they said this allows you to succeed unilaterally because this gives you a cultural identity. Guys, you can have cultural identities within your nations as well. Like the Highland Scots are clearly different from the Lowland Scots. You don't need to be your own nation to express a cultural identity. Secondly, we think there is very strong legal and rights precedent for us to say you can't exercise your rights if you're going to hurt yourself. The first case is in the case of seatbelts. You can say, I don't want to wear a seatbelt, this affirms my identity, but we force you to wear a seatbelt anyway because this protects you. You can say, I want to fast to death to express my own personal anger at the state or something. This affirms me and who I am. But any sane person in any sane state would stop you from effectively committing suicide because it hurts all your other rights because just to prove a single one. The case of unilateral secession is analogous to this. Even if we accept this somehow fundamentally affirms a person's identity, we shouldn't let states unilaterally secede because it's going to result in tons of deaths, civil war, and collapsed states. I'm going to prove why right now in the next point of contention on conflicts between nations. From the very first speaker, we told you that nations are going to be pretty angry if big parts of them break away. Team Ireland said, no, this will let nations talk nicely to each other as equals. No, that's not what people feel. That's not what nationalistic politicians are going to say. They are going to say, these guys broke away without us saying, if you wait a while, sir, that they were allowed to break away. Our forefathers spilled blood for this land in vain. And then they're going to encourage people to attack these nations. We've given you clear examples of where this has happened. We think Team Ireland filled with you a bit. Try and deal with it now, sir. Sir, even if that is true, and sometimes we think there won't be violence, but even if there will be, you need not think that's okay. It's going to end oppression, which is something that's happening in China. The problem is it's not going to end oppression because you haven't shown us who is going to stop China. At first you told us the United States was going to stop China. And then we said they can't. And then your third speaker said, well, lots of other countries have armies too. Okay, who has armies? Do you think France and Germany are going to attack China when China happens to have nukes and is their largest trading partner? No. Do you think of any of us poor Southeast Asians are going to attack China? No. The Chinese will come over, spit on us, and be proud. Wow. No. <laughs> time and time again. It filled in Rwanda, it filled in Sabrinitia. We don't want to cause more massacres on our side of the house. Team Ireland are willing to stand for this, but Team Singapore is not. No one will protect these nations. That's why we think we should not allow this. Next. Then Team Ireland came up with this argument that conflict between nations is going to be stopped by a so-called level playing field. But the analysis presented on Team Singapore suggests that it's precisely this level playing field that is going to cause the two nations to go to war with each other. 
If you think about it, it's a lot more counterintuitive for a nation to suggest to its own people that they oppress their fellow citizens than it is for a nation to suggest to its own people that they declare war on a foreign country which basically has thumbed its nose at the entire population of your own country by breaking away what you did not want it to. We think the fact that now they are their own nation and not individual citizens of your own country who have votes and you are forced to give them rights means that nations can and will be willing to continue with conflict between them. Team Ireland's accusers of only using the example of China and that. No. We've given you the example of North and South Sudan. We've given you the example of India and Pakistan. We've given you systemic reasons why this trend will continue for any future unilateral secession. So we think we've proven our case on this point. Next argument. What happens within regions? I'd like to point out that the vast majority of my second speaker's point was rebutted by a single line from that the house. All they said was, oh, oppression within regions exists in the status quo. But that doesn't understand the depth of analysis my second speaker presented. He told you that the threat of secession will cause these oppressions to worsen. He gave you clear examples of how this happened after the Batani Muslims threatened to secede. Oppression of the Batani Muslims in the south of Thailand only increased. Same for the Moros Muslims in Mindanao and the Philippines. Yes, sir. By that logic, why would they ever devolve power in any way to these countries and these regions? Why would they ever allow that for that? Because we think devolving power is very different from letting you become your own nation, as you have said, and as we agree. We think it's far more palatable to the people of the state to say they can govern their own educational policy than this land which we fought and died for does not belong to my nation anymore. So that's why they'll be willing to give them devolution. And you know what, guys? Even if they weren't willing to give them devolved powers, we think secession would be terrible, terrible, terrible anyway. The next argument that they fail to deal with on this point of conflict between within nations is Benjamin's point about how nations that see tend to engage in reprisals of how the dominant ethnic group or dominant region within these nations. We haven't heard any point of Team Ireland for coming back from this apart from saying somehow India and Pakistan doesn't fit the model because the British weren't smart enough to draw clear border lines. No, we think they did. We think this fits the sort of debate we are talking about. And in fact, this causes even worse problems because people oppress each other and engage in reprisals within nations. So what would Team Ireland really have left? They had a case that reduced itself firstly to Scotland and a principle which I've shown you earlier doesn't make any sense. Furthermore, on Team Singapore, we further prove to you in my second speaker's points of analysis that the Team Ireland's case rests itself on a very small string of points that are completely failed to prove the fact that between nations and within nations, conflict will always exist. So what have we shown you together as a team? Firstly, that Team Ireland's criteria doesn't make any sense in this debate. And even if it did, sometimes we can take away your rights in order to protect greater ones. Secondly, that conflict between nations is systemic and will always exist. Finally, that conflict within regions will always exist. Fundamentally, even if nations seem like they meet Team Ireland's criteria now, the act of unilateral secession will only ensure that the host country forces them away from meeting Team Ireland's criteria. Scotland might have a great economy now, but if you guys have seen, England will make you economically unviable. And that's why we should go with Team Singapore today.